Spider-Man animated series. It changed my life. It influenced what I am. It influenced what I do. I love this show so much, and I'm so honored that you are all here with us today for the 25th anniversary of Spider-Man the Animated Series. It was a show that was innovative. It was excellent. It was the first time I saw combined 3D animation with 2D animation. It blew my mind. So I won't tell you so much about that morning on November 19th, 1994. <laughs> You've all heard me talk about it so many times. So I want to be here today to celebrate the man who put it all together, Mr. John Semper. And I'm not going to be talking much on this panel. I'm just up here as a placeholder because I wanted to be a part of it. And so, John, without further ado, may we present Spider-Man the Animated Series 25th Anniversary. Yay. Well, this is kind of a kickoff for me uh, because this is really the beginning of uh, the, the, the celebration of the 25th anniversary. Um, as you know, it really doesn't start until the end of this year. Uh, but I figured this is one of my favorite places to be, and it's always a lot of fun to come here. And Matt's so, Matt's so enthusiastic about the series that uh, it really, the whole thing should begin here. Um, so, I'm going to show you the opening sequence of an animated show. It'll probably be hugely familiar to you. I know you'll be very excited to see this. This is where it all begins, right here. Select the speaker. So go. He means, he means this, the up arrow that was right here. Yeah. yeah. Now it's gone. It's gone. See you in full screen. Right, it's pretty bad. The up arrow. So right. Up arrow. So hit this. There you go. There we go. No, no. no. So okay. The sound. The sound icon. Sound icon. Well, that's not an up well, arrow, is it? Right. No, no. So, okay. Now we a little up arrow. A little up arrow. There we go. All right. Now we have to click on the speaker. This one. There we go. Now let's try this. Let's try this. And raise the volume. The volume's going to be very loud now. It should be. There we go. Dream of dreams for me and you. You're not dreaming of the moon. Dreaming, make your sweetest dreams come true. You work at night when the lights are low. They give off such a beautiful glow. Sending sweet dreams go near and far from the beautiful magical star. Dreaming it's a moon dreamers Help me to make me turn out wrong You're not dreaming it's a moon dreamers Moon dreamers Make your dreams to fly Okay, so you're probably Tremendously familiar with this opening sequence, right? <laughs> I know I am. Um, for me, this is where the Spider-Man adventure begins, because this was the very first show that I ever ran with my then writing partner, Cynthia Friedlow. And uh, it's a very significant show, because not only was it the first show that I ever ran, and this was actually a, a, uh, a little series that was in the middle of My Little Pony. Um, and this was a series that was done for Hasbro, and basically the whole My Little Pony Hasbro thing, all the animated shows that Hasbro did were, were designed to sell their toys, so this was a, 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 an incredibly girly toy line. But um, I was at Marvel at the time, and this was the first show that I got. And the reason that it's where the whole thing begins is because it starts here. It starts... Um, in this building. This is a building in Van Nuys that's at the intersection of Oxnard and Sepulveda. Yeah, the building's still there. They have changed the colors, however. This was where Marvel Productions was. Marvel Productions is a company that no longer exists, but it was an animation company. It had been to Patty Freeling, 
and they turned it into um, Marvel Productions. And I was working there at the time. I was on staff. I had uh, I had come over from Hanna Barbera, and uh, Moon Dreamers was the show that I was given at Marvel Productions, uh, and this was where uh, I got my first opportunity, as I said, to run a show. The significance of working in Marvel Productions, however, and Marvel, you have to understand, mostly just did Hasbro stuff. That was kind of what the company existed for. But the significance was that my partner and I, okay, there's the logo for Marvel Productions. Very first time that Spider-Man was animated in CG, CGI. And it was the coolest uh, thing ever. And yeah. I'm not going to get through this if you're going to... Oh. <laughs> I, I warn you in advance, because uh, is, i got a lot to show. Um, and I love this guy, that's why I can talk to him that way. He's, he's phenomenal. Um, Marvel Productions, it's the first time that Sp Spider-Man was ever animated in computer animation in our end logo. But the interesting thing about Marvel Productions was we didn't do anything Marvel. Uh, and that was kind of frustrating. And it was especially frustrating for this guy. Um, this is where I met this guy. Uh, he had an office in the back. And um, this is Cynthia and I, Cynthia Friedlove and I. And, and it was a really big moment for me because when I was younger, I had been a comic book fan. And I had always really loved superheroes, and I had always thought that, that someday I would want to do something with superheroes. So um, I grew up in, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, here I am in high school. I was an AV geek. I was the person who could thread a, a 16 millimeter projector with my eyes closed. Um, every morning I would take the subway to, uh, to um, school. And there in the subway, as some of you will remember, they would always sell magazines and comic books at kiosks. And here's a typical uh, example of what a comic book display would be like in a magazine kiosk. This is where we bought comics before there, for all you young people out there, this is where we purchased comics before there were comic book stores. There were no comic book stores. You either got it on the stand or you did not get it. There was no aftermarket, there were no resales, there were no comic book collector people. It was just, you got the comic when it came out, if you missed it, you missed it. And I, one day, happened to come by and there was this guy on the comic book cover. Now, I did not notice him in this amazing fantasy issue, although I'm sure that it was on the stand and I would have had an opportunity to buy it. I probably came in right around here. Um, issue number three of Amazing Spider-Man. So, uh, what did I discover when I picked up this comic book? Well, you know, they're in the subway. Well, I discovered that there was this really cool guy named Peter Parker who was exactly my age. So this is uh, the uh, sort of mid, mid 60s, late 60s, 66, something like that. Um, anyway, he was exactly my age and we were going through a lot of the same things together. The really cool thing about him was that he was a superhero. And he had this ability to do all kinds of amazing things um, while at the same time living a life that was very similar to my own. He, had, he didn't have a lot of money, uh, he had girlfriend trouble, he you know, was not the, uh, the, the most popular kid in class. Uh, in fact, he was frequently pushed around by the popular kid in class, class Frank, Flash Thompson. Um, Matt, can you do me a favor and grab me a water? Of course. Thanks very much. Um, but I identified with this guy, and I was really kind of amazed. First of all, uh, I had come from being a primarily a DC fan, and you know, you saw me in the earlier picture with my Superman costume. And um, Superman was was a great comic book, but it was all superhero stuff. There was no there was no person, you know, personal life, and uh, he certainly uh, didn't suffer from the kinds of things that Peter Parker did. So I immediately connected with this character. The great thing that was going on was that. Um, well, and of course he had tragedy, he had great tragedy, and he had to learn the lesson that with great power there must come great responsibility, and that was an important lesson for uh, me to learn at that time, and it was the kind of thing you didn't find in a comic book. I mean, these kinds of stories with emotional, personal stories, and death, and uh, loss, you just didn't find it. So, um, as this lean, silent figure slowly faded into the gathering darkness, uh, and realized that with great power there must also come great responsibility. A legend was born, and definitely a fan was born, uh, in that I became a huge fan of this character. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, now I'm happy to have him here. <laughs> <laughs>
There we go. So, yeah, I became a huge Spider-Man fan. And I also became a fan of this guy, um, Mr. Stanley. Now, you have to understand that at the beginning, and, and a lot of you out there uh, are, are in my age group and, and remember this, um, at the beginning, we didn't know who drew comic books. We didn't know who wrote comic books. We didn't care. All we did was we got the comic book and we read the comic book. This guy introduced credits, um, really, uh, to my generation. I know that there had been some credits earlier with, with uh, um, uh, Kirby and, and uh, Simon, but um, this guy made it a big deal. He put a banner at the very beginning of every comic book and he made you aware of who the artist was. And it's the first time we started paying attention to artists and paying attention even to the letterer, Artie Stimmick. <laughs> Uh, you know, we didn't know who these guys were, but most importantly, we also knew him. And um, he was a huge influence on me in terms of storytelling uh, and in terms of how to create worlds, uh, imaginary worlds. Uh, I had the tremendous pleasure of seeing him. I, I graduated from Harvard um, while I was an underclassman there. He came and visited and lectured, and it was one of the best nights of my life, a $15 ticket. Uh, and it was $15 well spent. Although later on when I met him, I told him that if I had known that I would know him for all these years, I would have never spent the $15. <laughs> um, but um, he was, this is sort of Stan the way he was when, uh, when he came to Harvard and spoke. And it was, it was great. I mean, he talked about the characters and the creation of the characters. He talked about how he didn't get along eventually with, with the artists. You know, at that point, Ditko had already left the strip, and Kirby, I think, was sort of on the verge of leaving. And Stan was very candid about uh, the difficulties of, of uh, dealing with the artists. I don't, by any means, mean to denigrate the contribution of Steve Ditko to um, Spider-Man. It was extremely important. Uh, but Stan really, for me, um, taught me how to tell stories without without my ever knowing him uh, at that point. Uh, I, I really understood how to make characters compelling and, uh, and, and interesting, thanks to Stan. So, working with this guy and getting to know this guy was a kick. I was a huge fan in college, and now here I was many years later, and he was right down the hall, and we were hanging out, and we were lunching, and we were uh, talking about everything under the sun. The thing that we weren't doing, however, was we were not doing anything related to Marvel. If you look at the posters on the walls on the side, you'll see that you'll see a Transformers poster, and in the other one with Cynthia, you can uh, see the uh, G.I. Joe poster. I mean, we, we couldn't sell anything to Marvel. What year did you start? Um, this would have been around 83, 82, 83, around in there, yeah. Um, and you, couldn't, you could not sell Marvel characters to a network. They didn't get it. They absolutely didn't get it. They didn't understand it. The only way you saw that, I don't know if you were here for the Batman thing, where uh, the Batman cartoon show had Batmite, uh, this little goofy character for the kids. You know, this is for the kids. Uh, I mean, you really couldn't sell Marvel. You couldn't give it away at that time. And uh, we were doing Transformers there. We were doing G.I. Joe. Um, my second show and my first network show was Spraggle Rock which I did for Jim Henson, and that was its own adventure. That was a lot of fun, getting to know Jim and getting to work with people. In fact, Bill Prady, who's one of the co-creators of uh, The Big Bang Theory, I met him. He was working for Jim at that time, and that's how Bill and I became friends. Uh, and uh, Kirk Thatcher, who directs all the Muppet stuff now, Kirk was just starting out working for Jim Henson at that time. It was a great time. It was a wonderful time, and I had a wonderful time working on that show. But we did not get to do anything Marvel. Uh, and that's me with the Fraggles. Um, and that's me with Doc and Sprocket. So I was having a wonderful time. I was getting to run shows. I was doing all kinds of fun things. But I was not considered an action-adventure writer. I was considered a comedy writer. Uh, and, I, and the cartoon people weren't doing uh, serious uh, superhero animation. <laughs> but then there was what I considered my very spidey Christmas. Because I got invited to, uh, I, over the years I kept up with Stan and we continued to be good friends. And uh, one year I got invited to uh, a Christmas party that he gave. And there was a very interesting guy there by the name of Jim Cameron. Uh, I, I, I swear to you, I'm not photoshopped into this picture. <laughs> Uh, that is uh, Stan the man himself. This was taken in his house. This was that Christmas party night. That's Jim Cameron next to Stan. Uh, touching Stan's lapel, adjusting his lapel, is Gail Ann Hurd. You might have 
You might know who she is. She's a producer. Visit that. She's a producer of, uh, of many of your you know, favorite sci-fi movies, um, Alien and whatnot. And uh, she was there that night. Also, Kevin Smith was there before he had, he had decided to don the uh, baseball cap and jersey. Um, and uh, there were a whole bunch of really interesting people there that night. But I was there. And Jim Cameron, at that particular time, had said that he was going to, um, he was going to make a, uh, a Spider-Man movie, as you may recall. He was going to do a Spider-Man feature. And everybody was very excited about that. That's, in fact, why Stan had invited him. And a woman by the name of Margaret Lesh was there. And Margaret, at that time, Margaret had been my boss at Hanna-Barbera, and then she had brought Cynthia and I over to Marvel when she came out to head Marvel. And then she moved to Fox and became the head of Fox and started up their Fox Kids Network. And um, she uh, happened to be there that night. At one point, there was a gathering of Stan and Jim Cameron and Margaret. And Margaret said, I want to do an animated show of Spider-Man. She was having big success with Batman the Animated Series. And she wanted to do Spider-Man to you know, piggyback on the, on the presumed success of Jim Cameron's new movie. Uh, and she said, uh, you know, we, we do it just like the movie you're going to make, and we get somebody really good to write it, like, like John. And I literally, I just happened to be standing there right at that moment. I could easily have been in the, in, you know, over the punch bowl or something. And she said, like John, and, and, and they got all excited about it. And so that's really the night that the deal was born, to do a Spider-Man cartoon show. And it was based on the success, uh, the, the, the supposed projected success of a Jim Cameron Spider-Man movie. So, having been there that night, and having been with uh, Stan and Jim Cameron, naturally, and having been there with Margaret, naturally, by the time they announced that they were going to do a show, they announced it with a completely different writer. I, had, I was not any part of the picture at all. In fact, when they finally got around to announcing the show, I was, uh, so here's the announcement, the uh, New World Entertainment Marvel Films Spider-Man show, and it's going to be written by some other guy, and he's going to be the head writer, and he's going to be the producer, and he's going to be the showrunner. Such is the way of Hollywood. In the meantime, I was working on this classic gem, uh, Puzzle Place, a cartoon, a, a puppet show that was uh, destined to become absolutely uh, forgotten. Um, I was doing it for PBS. Um, the only cool thing about this show, A, I got a bunch of trips to New York, which was fun. I'm originally from the East Coast, so it was fun to go back home, but B, um, the, the, the man who designed all the puppets was Kevin Clash, the uh, creator of uh, Elmo. So at any rate, I'm working away on Puzzle Place, and then one day, I get a phone call from this guy. I get a phone call from Stan. And he says, uh, John, we're going to do Spider-Man. I said, I know Stan. I saw the announcement uh, in Variety. He said, and, uh, you know, we're, we're having a tough time making a deal with uh, this guy that, uh, that we're going to get for the head, as the head of the show. And, uh, and I want to tell them, if we can't make the deal, I want you to do it. So I said, Stan, I'd be delighted. Great, okay. So, um, after a while they made the deal, and Stan called me back and he said, uh, there's no deal, you know, he said, we made the deal, I'm really sorry to get you all, all excited about it, and I said, Stan, don't worry about it. And I continued working on Puzzle Place, I said, you know, I'm gainfully employed, uh, it's okay. And, you know, at that particular moment I decided I'm never going to be able to do anything related to Marvel. Because I've, you know, I've now missed the big plum, uh, and believe it or not, I sold all my Marvel comics at that at that moment. So all my Marvel comics went away, and this is an interesting lesson, because sometimes if you let things go, things come flowing back. Because shortly after I sold all my comics, I got a phone call from this guy, <laughs> and he said, that, and it was literally months later months later, they had, they had been working on getting the show out the door, and he said, uh, John! I said, hi, Steve. I said, it's not working out. We're not, we're, we're not getting a show. The show's not getting out the door. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, there is a problem, uh, and, uh, and we're going to let the showrunner go, and we're desperately in need of, of someone to get the show out the door and get it done right, and, uh, and I want you. He said, this time, this time I told them. It's got to be John Semper. Excelsior. <laughs> uh, I left Puzzle Place, making a lot of people very angry. I'm sure they're angry to this very day, but you know what? No one remembers this show, and I'm here because I did Spider-Man, so the hell with Puzzle Place. <laughs>
and now here I am, and I have now joined the, uh, the crew that is trying to get a Spider-Man show out the door. So from left to right, that's John Cauley, our production supervisor, Dennis Venizelos, our art director, me, uh, Stan Mann, and Bob Richardson, who was our supervising producer. Um, it was a very bad situation on Spider-Man in the beginning because they really they had, they had blown about uh, I don't know six months and they just had no show um, and they were on the verge of not getting the show on the air and I think by the time I came on Fox had pretty much decided that these guys didn't know what they were doing and Fox kind of didn't want the show on the air uh, so in a, in a weird kind of a way uh, the only reason that Fox approved me was because it was sort of like eh, we're not going to do the show anyway. Let that let let him come on. Um, but amazingly enough, I did get the show out the door. Um, the uh, alliance between Bob and I um, was a little uneasy. Uh, Bob sort of wanted to control all of the show, and I, my contract was that I was pretty much in charge of all the writing. And I always make this a point: Bob did everything that there was visual about the show. He designed the show, he was in charge of all the artists, and he did an amazing job. I think the show looks spectacular, even to this day. Uh, I think he did a really wonderful job. But I think it was frustrating to him that he could not control me, and then uh, I was in charge of all the stories and the writing, which I take full credit for, credit and or blame. Uh, and, um, and I think that it was a little frustrating to me that I couldn't communicate better with him. So, however, we managed to have something of a truce and get the show out the door. Um, Here's the, uh, the triumphant trio here. There's Bob on the left and Stan and then myself. And this is us in our prime when we were really in the middle of the show. So now I begin. I begin the task of working on the show and being the head writer and the story editor. This Spider-Man here that you're looking at was the only Spider-Man toy that I could find at that time. And I always like to have my character in front of me when I write. So the one you see in the picture there is the very same Spider-Man that you were looking at at this very moment. He has a lot of significance because he inspired me to get through 65 half hours of uh, Spider-Man the Animated Series. <laughs> so there you go. It's the very same one. And there I am in front of my primitive IBM computer. Uh, and there's another publicity photo of me. And there's another publicity photo of me, in case you didn't know what I looked like. So, uh, I am wearing my little Spider-Man pin in that picture right there. Um, OK, so here's the problem. Now, you're, we're going to do a Spider-Man show. What's it going to be like? Well. We decided very upfront that it was going to be the uh, Johnny Romita, 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 uh, Johnny Romita uh, uh, Spider-Man because he's the one. You know, this is before there was a movie, and this is before any kind of real, real live-action presence for Spider-Man existed. So we wanted people to have the feeling that there was a real human being inside of there, and that whole anime thing that everyone does now hadn't really taken root yet in Saturday morning television. Uh, the kind of the sort of half anime, half American animation thing hadn't taken root. So this was really the, the style that we were going for. There's Mr. Amita himself, and there is a sense of, of his characters. And you'll see that really very much our show. I think the uh, 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 Todd McFarlane was really hot that year. The only thing we borrowed from him was the design of the webbing. Um, but the, the actual design of the character is very much Johnny Romita. And I, I should know the, how to pronounce the name because I just got through working uh, for DC and I was at many functions with his son, who's now a very prominent DC artist. Did, was anyone pushing for like the hot uh, McFarland type of style or anything? No. Nobody was. Again, nobody cared about comic books. You totally have to understand that on the network they did not give two farthings about comic books. It meant nothing to them. In fact, um, Marvel at the time was going bankrupt. Uh, because comic books were going through a horrible slump and nobody cared about them. So um, you will be shocked to hear that I had absolutely no Marvel oversight whatsoever. I think Marvel gave some notes at the very beginning and then uh, Avi Arad, who was actually the producer on my series, uh, told them to basically to show off and, uh, and that we were going to do our own thing. And I had absolutely no oversight from Marvel. I did, however, have a lot of oversight from Avi. Um, so. All right, so now we're going to do the Spider-Man show. So what are we going to do? What's it? So now we know what it's going to look like. Bob did a really cool thing, um, and here we are again trying, pretending to try to figure out what the show is going to be for publicity purposes. But that's Dennis Venezuelos, the art director, who did a wonderful job. Bob did a wonderful job, and then there I am. Um, 
Bob did a thing. He actually hired an actor to come in in the Spider-Man costume and pose as a way of getting a sense of what a real Spider-Man would look like. Uh, and you can really see that, that there's, it's very inspirational when you look at the model sheets of Spider-Man. Uh, and some of these model sheet figures we used in the end credits, some of you might recognize them from the end credits. But that was going to be our Spider-Man. And then we start designing in addition to this, and again, in the models you have to design all the angles. Now notice we're doing the webbing. That means that there's going to have to be some real cost in this, because if you'll notice in all the previous Spider-Man animated shows, they do a little bit of webbing on the costume, but then mostly it's just red to save money. We're obviously not going to do that. We're going to do the real thing. And um, that's kind of the way it was approached. So after that, we start designing the characters. Uh, Peter Parker. Um, people say Peter only wore the shirt. No, Peter had a whole range of outfits and costumes. <laughs> I've seen that meme that goes around, 65 episodes, one shirt. It's all bullshit. <laughs> Pardon my language, it's just foolishness. Uh, Peter had a lot of different outfits during the course of the, uh, of the show. Here, by the way, is the explanation for how he did his Spider-Man costume underneath a short sleeve shirt. You see, he rolled everything up. See that? Oh. See, it, it, actually, they did think about that. You know, Again, I had nothing to do with this. This is all Bob and his team of wonderful artists. Um, and this is a wonderful artist in Russia named Pavel Mihalkov. Who, uh, with whom I'm working on a couple of projects, and he's a huge Spider-Man fan, and he colored this in, this model sheet, with the colors that we used in the show. And it's the clearest image I have of this, so I'm using a lot of Pavel's uh, artwork for this presentation. Here's our model sheet for Mary Jane Watson. Pavel colored it in, using the colors that we had. Here's our stylish Aunt May. Deborah Whitman was a character that I plucked out of obscurity in the comic books. Uh, I, in the pilot, I wasn't sure how I was going to handle any of the romance, and I didn't want to get de you know jump right into uh, Mary Jane Watson. I didn't want to jump right into Felicia Hardy if we were going to do Felicia Hardy or Gwen Stacy if we were going to do her. So I used Deborah Whitman, totally unknown character, a uh, character that nobody really paid any attention to, very deep in the comics somewhere, but she was going to be our female lead for the pilot. To buy, you know, give me some time to figure out what the hell I was going to do. Um, here we have a model sheet for Betty Brandt. Betty Brandt was very prominent in the comic books, as you may know, but we ended up not using her in the show at all. So you can see that there's uncertainty already because we're designing characters that I don't even know if I'm going to use. So my question is, what am I going to do? Right, how am I going to write this show? Am I going to write it like the old Ralph Bakshi Spider-Man show? Well, in fact, I watched a bunch of those and they were so horrendous. Um, in retrospect, when I was a kid they were great, but in retrospect, uh, as, as an adult, uh, they were horrible. You can see the, the, how the webbing ends right you know, at the end of the net. Um, and so I decided it wasn't clearly going to be written like that. Uh, the other prominent animated Spider-Man show prior to mine was Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. That was more of a kiddie Saturday morning show, so we definitely weren't going to do that. There was the Nicholas Hammond live-action Spider-Man, where he, uh, he used his one web uh, swinging around the one or two tall buildings in downtown L.A. to stand in for New York. Uh, you may remember that. It has its charm. I really kind of enjoy it. I, didn't, I hated it when I was younger, because uh, it so clearly wasn't Spider-Man. But at any rate, uh, Nicholas is a great guy, and so I always say great things about him. Uh, because he, he, you know, he was the first real live-action Spider-Man, really. Um, and then there was Supaidaman, uh, who was the job. Yeah, I mean, I love this stuff. This was great. This is sort of the uh, Power Rangers Spider-Man. And of course, he's best known for having a robot. Um, now, the funny thing was, at the very end of my series, uh, I did do the Parallel Universe Spider-Man, who had a robot. And it was actually a tribute to this, uh, to this particular iteration of character. Um, there were things that I did decide that I wanted to do. For instance, I wanted to bring back some of the things that Ditko had created that had been lost in time. How many of you remember the spider beam? Yeah! Okay, I wanted to bring back the spider beam, and sure enough, you will see it in uh, Night of the Lizard, our pilot episode. So, I'm starting to figure out what it is that I want to do. Now, when I get on Facebook, I had a Spider-Man Facebook page, and I would say, I did this, and I did that, and I did the other, and there would always be three or four disgruntled people who would go, who do you think you are? You did this, and you did that, and you did the other. That's sort of the gen general tone of Facebook, as you, as you may have, uh, you know, you suck. Um, 
<laughs> but the reality is that I had a tremendous amount of control. I had a, an obscene amount of control. I had a lot of oversight for the first 13 episodes, so I did not have a lot of control over them because everyone wanted to have a hand in ironing out the show, and we spent a lot of time with Avi and with Stan and with all the, you know, the, the members of the creative team. But after 13, when they realized that the show sort of was up and running, they left me alone. And I had no oversight from Marvel, as I told you. Um, and so when I say I did this and I did that, I really mean it. Uh, as far as the stories are concerned, I had nothing to do with the artwork. But it's funny because when I say that on, online, I'll say, well, I decided to do Nick Fury and I decided to do Doc Strange and I decided. And people will think it's just some huge ego trip. But it's the reality of the way things were back then. If you were the showrunner, you know, the network had a certain amount of say, but you were, you were supposed to come up with the stories one a week, one script a week. And you really just had to bang them out. And um, these properties weren't the, the diamonds that they are now. So, you know, uh, you, you really got a lot of control. And this is true, uh, I don't know if you ever seen my friend Eric Leewald do his panel about the X-Men show. But you had, we had control over these characters. I had control over Spider-Man for two years. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I decided I wanted to bring back the Spider-Beam and you'll see it on the pilot. Now the other thing is, who are the villains going to be? What villains would I use? Spider-Man's universe is filled with villains and really my head was swimming. Uh, and finally I thought, well I know the villain that we're going to do. He's going to be the hottest villain. He's going to be our first villain. The hottest villain in the Spider-Man universe in 1993 was not Sandman, because I was told I couldn't use Sandman. He was going to be in Jim Cameron's movie. There were two villains I was told I could not use, Sandman and Electro. But I did at the very end of my series, when I realized Cameron's movie wasn't going to happen, I did use Electro, right at the very end. So Sandman was the only guy that I never ended up using, but I did have Hydro Man, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> So I probably wouldn't have used Sandman anyway once I decided to use Hydro Man. But the number one villain that I thought we will use, we will start with this villain, you all remember him, is a guy named Venom. Um, but you will also remember that he wasn't the number one villain that we started with. He wasn't the first one. And that's because no matter how hard we tried, we could not come up with a decent Venom story that would be a decent pilot. Because there was so much story that you had to tell about Venom. You know, how he came about before you could, you could use him. So then I thought, okay, we're going to start with the Scorpion. There was a lot of bickering going on in the uh, behind the scenes, and I, th and I thought, you know, if I just stick to a Stan story, something Stan did in the comic books, then it will, it will uh, calm everybody down, and there will not be a lot of complicated thought. We'll just take a simple story, beginning, middle, and end. <coughs> and I thought that the, um, that the Scorpion would be the perfect person to start out with. And of course, as that developed, I realized that the really the best villain to start out with would, would be the lizard. Um, so I started out with the lizard. We did Night of the Lizard, and uh, and I uh, from there I could now start writing a script. This is actually a script from uh, the Chameleon. Uh, I used to put the comic book covers on the front of our scripts to inspire the artists. So this is for Day of the Chameleon, uh, which uh, actually ended up being our final script of season one. It was the 13th script. This was a script that I myself wrote. Uh, actually, I hired a writer, one of my staff writers, to write it, and I was, I was telling her the story, and I got so wrapped up in it, and she was not really that interested in doing it, and I finally just said, oh, the hell with it, I'll write it. Uh, and it's a good thing I did, because I ended up getting nominated for an Annie Award for this script. Uh, I loved it. I mean, some scripts are agony, and other scripts are like putting a hot knife through butter. And this one just flowed, you know, uh, really. And we got very little notes on it, and it, it was pretty much the way that the way that I wrote it. This is what a script looks like. This, my friends, is where it all begins. So I know many of you are into comics, and you're very artist obsessed, and the artist does this, and the artist does that. At least in animation, and quite frankly in comic books as well, uh, this is where it all begins. It all begins on the printed page. It's a bunch of words, and a bunch of dialogue balloons, or in this case lines, that are going to be recorded. And this is where it begins. From that, we start working on the storyboard. And this is the, uh, this is the storyboard for Night of the Lizard. Uh, 
uh, it shows uh, the artist st uh, start draw starts drawing from the script. And I'm very meticulous about my scripts. I break all the shots down and break all the scenes down. That's what I learned from working in Hanna Barbera, because it was cost effective. And if there's anything Bill Hanna was about, it was about being cost effective. So um, the artists really had a lot to work from from the scripts that I and my writers were generating. Uh, so here you go, everything's broken down shot by shot. Now from there, we get to my favorite part, which is being with a bunch of actors in a studio, in a recording studio. Um, so from left to right is Patrick Labierto, Jennifer Hale, Bob, Bob Richards, Bob Richardson, myself, Christopher Daniel Barnes, the voice of Spider-Man, uh, Saratoga Valentine in the red, she's the voice of Mary Jane Watson, Greg Berger, who was the voice of Mysterio and Craven the Hunter, and Gary M. Huff, who was Harry Osborne. Uh, Patrick Labierto on the left was uh, Flash Thompson, and Jennifer was Felicia Hardy. So there you go. This is, for me, the fun, is working with these guys. This is us in the green room prior to the recording session. We'd start early in the morning around 9 o'clock. Uh, we'd all be half awake. You can see that they're all bleary-eyed, and they're all drinking coffee and eating donuts and whatnot. And we're about to start recording. And then we go into the recording booth and uh, get set up. And uh, they all, are all going to work together and do the lines. And it's like a radio show. This guy is an amazing talent, Christopher Daniel Barnes. Incredible talent. He, of course, was our voice of Spider-Man. He is an amazing actor. People are always coming up to me and saying, I can do cartoon voices. You know, that kind of thing, because I think that's what a cartoon voice is. No, a cartoon voice is being an amazing actor. And, uh, by the way, Karen Kaler is a wonderful cartoon voice. She's sitting right in front. She is currently the voice of uh, one of the, uh, sort of the snake-like character in Little Witch Academia. And in order to be a good voiceover person, you have to be a, a good actress, as Karen is. Um, Karen is going to um, do the voice of Madam, Madam Webb, and I'll talk to you about that as we get to the end. Uh, at any rate, uh, there's Chris working, and he is an amazing actor, and he did an amazing job. There's Saratoga, the voice of Mary Jane Watson. I still get a kick. I run into Saratoga a lot. And I always make her do, face it, tiger, you just hit the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> just for me. Um, Patrick Labberto, there's um, Nick. Oh, I can't think of Nick's last name. He's, he's a good buddy, and in fact, my last car was his ex-car. Uh, Nick James. Nick was the voice of Morbius. Uh, the girls used to love it when he'd get in the, in the recording booth and go, Felicia. <laughs> they go, oh, just do it for us one more time, Nick. Felicia. There's my buddy Ed Asner, the voice of J. Jonah Jameson. Ed loves me. Um, Joe Campanella, the late Joe Campanella, was the voice of Kurt Connors, the lizard. Uh, Martin Landau uh, was the voice of the scorpion. Uh, Roscoe Lee Brown, working with Martin Landau. Mark Roscoe Lee Brown was the voice of the kingpin. Yeah. The late Roscoe. Uh, the late Ephraim Zimbalis Jr. was the voice of Dr. Octopus. Now, I had grown up watching his TV show, 77 Sunset Strip, so for me, this was like heaven to be in the room with all these stars. Uh, Max Caulfield was, who was the voice of Alistair Smythe. Um, the, uh, the ladies, there's Jennifer Hale on the left, Felicia, and then this is Liz George. She was the voice of um, Deborah Whitman. Uh, and there's Greg. Greg um, as the voice of uh, Mysterio and Craig the Hunter. This is Jeff Corey. Jeff Corey... I can't remember who he did. Um, he was much later down the line, but Jeff Corey is a famous, famous, famous actor. Uh, and we were in the booth with all these incredible actors. Uh, and it was great. It was a wonderful time. It was my favorite time of making, of doing animation, is being in the booth with, with wonderful, talented actors. This fellow here is Saratoga Ballantyne's father. He's Carl Ballantyne, and you will recognize him from McHale's Navy, if any of you remember that sitcom. Uh, I wrote a part for him just so that I could get to work with him. Uh, and Sarah was very happy to have an opportunity to work with her dad. Um, he was a kind of a minor character uh, in uh, one of the episodes that involved the spot, as I recall. Uh, but anyway, we got to work with Carl. Um, Favorite actor, Scott Cleverton on the left uh, is uh, the voice of uh, Cletus Cassidy, uh, Carnage. And Scott is Scottish, and he lives, I believe, I'm not sure, I think he lives in Spain right now, but we're still in contact. And um, one day he happened to mention to me that he had married the lead of a thing called Sharp's Rifles. 
which, and I was a huge fan of Sharp's rifles. That's Sean Bean on, on the right, and on the left is the, is the female lead, Asunta Serna, who's a very famous actress. And I said, you're kidding, you're married to Asunta Serna? And he, did, he was shocked that I even knew who she was. So he then did me the favor of bringing her to one of the recording sessions, and I got to meet this wonderful, amazing actress who, you know, whom I was madly in love with. Um, so that, that was cool. And there's Tony uh, um, Pastor, our voice director, and Bob Richardson. And I gotta hurry, there's a couple guys that worked in the booth, and there we all are in the booth. And this lady here, Megan Ward, you may not know it, but she was the original voice of Felicia Hardy. Um, unfortunately, after a while, they decided that they wanted to change her over to Jennifer Hale. However, Megan and I are still friends. So, um, she, Megan ended up on uh, General Hospital and did a lot of movies and stuff. Uh, this is the original voice of uh, Robbie Robinson. I'm giving you all the background stuff now. Brock Peters, the famous actor Brock Peters from To Kill a Mockingbird, was the original voice of Robbie Robertson. But Avi didn't like him because he didn't sound black enough. <laughs> So we ended up with Rodney Salisbury, who not only sounds black enough, but is also one of the most talented voiceover people that I know, and also a very good friend of mine. Uh, this is Nell Carter. Nell was the voice of Glory Grant, uh, J. Jonah Jameson's secretary. Nell Carter took one look at me and hated me from the moment she saw me. <laughs> All the other actors were nice to me. Nell Carter, I can say this now because she is, she's no longer with us, Nell Carter hated me the minute she walked in the room. And she was. She spent so much time ranting and raving about me. The whole OJ thing was going on at that time, and she decided I was OJ, and just tore into me. I'll never forget that. Uh, so Lori Grant did not appear very much on the show. <laughs> That's what happens when you piss off the writer, the head writer, the writer producer guy. Um, so. This is an interesting thing. I don't know that I want to spend a lot of time with it, but somebody on uh, YouTube uh, did the first part of uh, Night of the Lizard uh, using our uh, storyboard pages. And I finished it off with the second part. I'm going to show you some of what I... Wait a minute. There we go. No. Oh, no, I know what this is. Hold on for a second. This is us working in the recording studio. So you want to get to see us recording? Yes. Uh, okay. Let's, let's, let's do that. Let's do... None of this is queued up, this is just sort of raw, naked footage. And this is Majel Roddenberry, Jean Roddenberry's wife, Nurse Chapel. Uh, she is uh, Mary Jane Watson's mother. And this is Linda Gary, who was Aunt May, and during the course of our production, Linda, um, uh, uh, it was discovered that Linda had cancer. So Linda actually did a lot of Aunt May while undergoing chemo. You'll see that she's got the hat on because she has lost her hair and she is sitting down. Uh, Linda actually did pass away during the course of our production, but she was a wonderful voiceover actress and she did a wonderful job with our name. Here they are having a conversation about uh, Peter Parker. It's sad. What it is? Well, I had always hoped Mary Jane would settle on Peter. Oh, well, pardon my frankness, May, but <laughs> Peter was never there for her. He's always running around late at night taking pictures and then. That's good. I like that. That was a good read. That was good. Excellent read. Excellent read. Fine. So anyway, Major Roddenberry, Nurse Chapel, as, uh, as Mary Jane Watson's mother. Now I'm going to jump forward and give you a little bit of... Uh, this is Chris in uh, Saratoga. You can see Chris mugging for the camera already. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Let's... let's uh, 126, take 276. I wanted to tell you myself before you found out from somewhere else. But Harry let the word out. Sometimes he's so impetuous, like a kid on Christmas morning. Close. Okay, real close. Do Sorry, Tony, because I thought maybe I should go back to Hello Tiger, so... Yeah, I, I know what you did. I know what you did. <laughs> I probably wasn't clear enough for you. Uh, it, but I want you to be one-on-one -on -one with him until someone else. But then take your side. But, you know, Harry, I, there's no way. Then you go into the girl you are now. So let's go 125. Uh, 125, take 277. Uh, yeah. I was a little surprised. I wanted to tell you myself before you found out from somewhere else. But Harry let the word out. <sighs> Sometimes he's so impetuous, like a kid on Christmas morning. I'm very happy for you. Actually, that's a lie. 
getting them to prove it. Um, I'm very happy for you. Oh, shit. I'm not going to lie to you. See what I mean? Give me a wonderful phone. Hey. Gee, it's good to see you again. Because <laughs> right. you got somewhere to go. Here we go. How are you? Yeah. 127, take 278. I'm very happy for you. Actually, that's a lie. <clears throat> Anyway, um, you get the idea. That's what it was like being in the booth with these guys. Wonderful, talented performers. Uh, and I had a great time with them, and I love them dearly. They're all still good friends. Um, okay, now we're animating, because we've recorded our soundtrack. We're animating. These are a couple of drawings that I stole from the production uh, before I left. These are actual pencil drawings. We didn't do very much uh, uh, on pencil. I, I think these were tests that were sent to us by TMS. Our animation was done overseas in Japan by Tokyo Movie Shincha. And um, I swiped a couple of these before I left the building uh, when I was all done. Um, and there's a really nice drawing. These are actually interesting that they're underlit. Uh, you can underlight them and the blue shows up and some of the highlights. And it's really very cool. Anyway, we finally ended up on the air. And I'm going to show you right now the very first footage that we got back. Now, here's the thing. When you do... Yeah, there it is. When you do animation, when you write an animated show, back in those days especially, when nothing, nothing was done really digitally, um, you do not see anything, you basically write the show blind, and you don't see anything uh, for a whole year practically, you know, like eight or nine months, and then one day footage comes in, and I'm now going to show you, and it's going to be very unspectacular, I'm now going to show you the very first footage that ever came in. I'm actually going to kill the sound, because we didn't get to hear any sound, you know, it was just the first clip of footage that we ever saw of our show being animated. Uh, and it's not that part. It starts here. It's there. Him sliding. Bang. Whoop. Boom. Bat. And then him sliding over the pipe. Boom. That was it. And you have to understand that the entire studio came to the screening room to sit and look at that footage, silent, because it was the first time we saw our Spider-Man brought to life. That was it. So that was what I wanted to show you there. Uh, okay, so we got on the air, amazingly enough. Con <laughs> no one believed that we would be able to do it. We had kind of a deadline. Uh, Avi was rolling out a toy line. You have to understand that the whole purpose of <laughs> making a show like this, for the network it was getting a show on the air, but for Avi it was getting toys sold because he owned a company called Toy Companies, uh, Toy, Toy Biz, which owned the uh, license to all the Marvel characters. Pardon me, I wasn't a mime on acid. I was giving it a little bit of a gnat. Um, uh, if we did not get on the air before Christmas, his toy line would sink and he would lose a lot of money. So uh, I wrote the Bible for this show in two weeks. Uh, I got the pilot script written in about four weeks. And we miraculously got the show out the door and done to air, in time to air in November. We did not, however, have time to get the rest of the series up and running. So the, the series did not actually premiere until, I think it was January or February. You were Fe February 13th. February 13th. <laughs> so see, this is why I keep them around. So there was a gap between Night of the Lizard, there was a, like a gap. So Night of the Lizard actually played almost like a special. And then Avi was happy because he was going to be able to sell his toys. It worked. There you go. Avi is the day I watched that show. There you go. See, that's, I mean, that's the power. That was the power that we had. And yes, there I was, producer and story editor, after a long uh, ordeal of getting the show out the door. Um, and then came, you know, much to our pleasure, the show was a huge hit. It was the number one show. Uh, we did uh, appearances. To promote the show, we did autograph signings. There I am sitting next to Stan. There I am with Roscoe, and there's the Kingpin toy. Um, and I, I love the way I love the way Chris photobombs this picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's Chris. He's great. He's he's great. I I, I love knowing him, and he's a wonderful guy. Um, this is me with Danny Bilson. Danny is I'm a big fan of Danny's because he wrote a movie that I called The Rocketeer. <clears throat> he co-wrote with his partner, Paul DeMeo, who passed away recently. But I did an autograph session with him, and here I am. This, this picture circulates a lot. This is me and Stan in our prime, uh, and, uh, and I love the man to death. Uh, now I have the whole universe at my command, the whole Spider-Man universe at my command. Um, yeah, I'm watching the time. I think we're yeah. 
So now we've, now we've got uh, villains galore and characters and all kinds of wonderful uh, things to choose from. I could do anything I wanted. I had the whole Marvel world at my disposal. I love Doctor Strange, so I did a couple of Doctor Strange episodes. I don't like the Hulk, so I didn't use the Hulk. Um, but here's Madam Web. I love Madam Web because when I told Avi that I wanted to do Madam Web, he said, I can't make a toy out of an old broad. <laughs> and my favorite toy is the Madam Web toy that he made based on my show. Uh, because I know that it never would have got, it never would have been made uh, if, uh, if I hadn't put her in the show. She was voiced by Joan Lee, the wife of Stan. We did Punisher, we did Carnage, we did all these wonderful villains in the show. Um, and I really uh, got to use everything. I love that they used Tombstone in the new Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse because we were the first ones to animate Tombstone. Uh, voiced by Dorian Harewood. The Spot, a character that I always loved. And yes, I did finally do Electro. Um, I did get him into the show. I also invented this little thing that is now called the Spider-Verse. <clears throat> and when I say this online, people get outraged. You know, there's like one contingency that goes, yes, you did. And they're the ones that remember it from the series. And then there's another group of people who are like outraged that I would presume. But in fact, I created a situation where a whole bunch of Spider-Men came together and uh, from different parallel universes and fought a common foe. And that is what we now refer to as the Spider-Verse, which just won an Academy Award. Did I get any part of that Academy Award? No. But I did get a no prize. <laughs> um, so there you go, that's, that's all I got. I got a good old-fashioned Marvel no prize. Uh, we did, however, win a Golden Reel Award for uh, Spider-Man Dave the Chameleon. Chameleon. Uh, they did spawn a uh, comic book. I have, if you come to my table afterwards, I have comic books for sale. Spider-Man Adventures that were based on my series. I'll be happy to autograph them for you. Uh, we did a 20th anniversary reunion with the cast. Um, five years ago, and uh, they're all still friends of mine, so I'm not a bad person to work for. All my writers, by the way, are still friends of mine, all my staff writers, and Jim Creed, uh, uh, to whom I gave his very first job in the, in the industry as a staff writer on Spider-Man, he's now in charge of all the Warner Brothers uh, director video features that are being done, uh, if you're fans of those, and uh, I'm pressuring him to get me to write one. So uh, we'll, see if, we'll see if that happens. We did do a reunion uh, at the Stanley's Kamikaze Expo. Um, I ended the series with Peter um, uh, saying that he's going to find Mary Jane. And for those of you who know, Mary Jane had fallen into this sort of uh, n in neutral zone, kind of this, this interdimensional zone. Um, at the end of the series, I had uh, Madam Webb say, we're going to find Mary Jane. And I thought that was the end of it, and it turns out I traumatized an entire generation of kids by not actually yeah, showing anybody yes. Mary Jane. So I'm happy to report that I have written a feature-length script called Peter Finds Mary Jane, in which you will actually find out how Peter found Mary Jane. Okay? Um, I, at the end of 65 episodes, I was done. I walked away. Spider-Man no more for me. Uh, I had a great experience, and I'm happy that the that the, uh, the show for people like Matt and some of you out there is still considered kind of iconic. Um, I did uh, in the very end. I did have Stan appear. Uh, it was not just for fun. It was really to have Spider-Man say, "I am now a different person than the guy you created. I'm, you know, I have evolved." And that for me was the end of the hero's journey. Um, the great thing about that was that I got to have a recording session where Stan and Joan were together in the booth doing lines that I've written. Uh, and I'm now going to show you for the very first time, I'm going to show you, oh this is the last time I saw Stan, uh, last time we were photographed together was at the Hollywood show and I just said, you know what, let's get a photo. And uh, he was uh, a great mentor, he was a great guy. I am so sick of all these people online who say, oh, Jack Kirby did it all and Stan was just bullshit. Please, you know, you gotta, it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort, it's a collaborative art form. Jack does great stuff, Stan does great stuff. Steve Ditko does great work, Stan does great work. Uh, and uh, without the writer, you really don't have, a, a, you know, a, a product. Uh, and everything I learned about writing, I learned from Stan. Um, I would ask those of you who are recording to turn off your cameras for this part, because I'd like to keep this footage.